think ever since I was a kid, um, I always wanted to, I knew I always wanted to do something in, in motorsport or racing. I always wanted to be a racing driver, basically. Uh, my grandfather used to race, my grandmother used to race, my dad uh, did a lot of racing and rallying. So, um, getting started in motorsport in India was very difficult and still is difficult. Um, you know, when I started, we had no go-kart tracks. I've never done a kart race in my life, which is a big disadvantage if you compare you know, your, your Hamiltons and your Rosbergs and people like that, uh, the years of karting they did uh, and how much you learn in karting. Um, and even someone like Max Verstappen today, who's able to go from karts to Formula One in two years. I, I think that really shows the value of karting. And I think that's something that, you know, I regret uh, missing out on. Uh, the next generation, the kids today have karting championships. You know, they, They've got races in India and they're able to fly to you know, other countries in Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, places like that. So, so they're able to get some sort of exposure, uh, still a long way behind what they'd get in Europe. Um, and it is a big disadvantage. You know, I, when I, we, I started off in um, a single-seater formula called Formula Maruti, uh, which is what we had in India. It was a small little 800cc engine, a four-speed gearbox, straight out of a road car. Um, and it was really quite good fun, you know, the, the level of driving um, was actually quite good. There were about, you know, 25 cars on the grid and we were, you know, we were fighting really hard. Um, so I started off with that when I was 16 and then in, um, the fall, when I won that championship, uh, I moved to Asia, um, to the Formula Asia Championship in 2001, um, which was similar, I guess, to Vauxhall Lotus in Europe, um, two litre Ford engine. Um, you know, basic slicks and wings, nothing too fancy. Uh, but again, it, you know, it gave me the chance to race across Asia. Um, you know, we went to Philippines, China, Malaysia, all these sort of places. Um, and a chance to, it was the next step up. Um, and it, it, you know, it gave me a lot of uh, exposure. It, it, you know, it was easy to take media from India to those races as well, because don't forget, I was only the second Indian, really, to, to be climbing the ladder um, towards Formula One. And, and even today, as we sit, I'm, you know, there are only two Indians who've done F1. So, you know, it, it was very much a process in those early days to educate the media, to educate the sponsors, to educate the public on what is motor racing. I think the circumstances of a driver coming from India or Japan or South America, or places like that, uh, particularly probably India, um, where the sport is not so well known. So you, you probably draw parallels to Malaysia and countries like that, where we're not such a well-known sport still uh, in the public eye. Um, you know, media support is hugely important. It was hugely important for me because I had commercial sponsors. You know, it, it's very different for, if you look at motorsport in Europe, a lot of the situations are, you know, drivers who's got, who have got family backing, or who have got you know, a single individual benefactor who've, who've backed their career, uh, like a foundation or something like that. But when I came to Europe, obviously it's a totally different situation. You know, you've got different teams and you've got um, different championships you can go to. Um, I chose to come to the UK, um, mainly because my dad knew people in the UK. Uh, we knew teams, um, we knew the guys at Carlin Motorsport very well and a few others. And, um, so I got introduced to T-Sport, the team I came to do F3 with. Um, yeah, it, it's, it was a massive change, you know, that was um, a massive culture shock in many ways. I came to England on the, as an 18 year old, straight out of school. Um, you know, I'd raced in Asia, but then you're still living at home and all that, so it's quite easy. Um, but I came here, I remember on the 1st of February 2002, and uh, you know, didn't really know anybody. Um, it's the middle of winter, you've come here, and uh, I went to, uh, to Brackley to meet my team at T-Sport. And uh, I remember we went to f look for a house, and the, guy, you know, the team manager, Russell Eacott, who's, uh, who's become like a second dad to me now, uh, he, you know, he said, where are you going to live? And I said, well, I don't know. I can, I can live here, I guess. I don't know anywhere else. So <laughs> we went around and uh, went to the estate agents and found a house that afternoon. And, um, you know, I'd come from Madras with 11 million people and Brackley's got about 11,000 people, you know, and uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. So um, I remember we went around and I said to the estate agent, I said, oh, so is this like the suburbs of the city? And he said, what do you mean? We've done three laps of the city already. So it was, it was a massive culture shock. You know, I didn't know how to cook. I didn't know. I couldn't even make tea. The first day the, the mechanics said to me when I went for a seat fit, 
um, come on, you're the new guy, you can go make tea. I went to the kitchen, I just, I just stood there, I had no idea. So, uh, it, it was a big change, you know, going to, going to Pembury and Snetterton and all these places where it's freezing cold. I'd never driven in the rain before, um, you know, in Asia. Normally it rains and it's like a monsoon, so it's a red flag. So it, it was a very steep learning curve. And I, there were some very tough days where, you know, I was crashing and, you know, I was not quick enough and just really struggling. The first six months um, of 2002 were, were very difficult. And now looking back in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have done Formula 3. I should have gone and done something like Formula Renault or Formula Ford and learned, you know, about European racing at a lower level first and then gone to F3. So I think racing in Europe is is so, so competitive. And, and now, you know, I say to some young drivers that I'm helping out and, and working with that really, if you can dominate in Asia, if you can win 50% of the races and win the championship in Asia, you have a chance of being in the top 10 in Europe. You know, that that is really the level uh, that you're looking at, the difference. So. But the, the most difficult thing, I think, is, is to understand just how difficult it is if you haven't got a budget to do it properly. Uh, especially in those days, because testing was free. Now it's all clamped down, you know, there's restricted testing, there's restricted sets of tyres and these, all these things. I mean, I remember mid-season, and in the end, you know, I ran out of budget uh, halfway through the season in 2004. Uh, I remember being in Pembury at a mid-season test and um, I think I was second quickest or something at the test and we looked at it and it was my 28th day of testing and I'd used about 55 sets of new tyres and Nelson Piquet was sharing a pit garage with me and that was his 54th day of testing so he'd done nearly double the testing and 95 sets of tyres or something like that so you know it was just impossible to compete and you know he went on to win the championship and um, it's just very, very difficult to compete at, at that level because you're, you're looking for a few tenths and it's that little extra mileage and a bit more experience with tyres and just learning a bit more about the car. That's the difference between being at the front every weekend and being at the front once in a while, which is what we were, you know. So, um, you know, it, it, it was, um, as I said, I learned a lot in F3, um, but I didn't get to complete really what, what I set out to do, which was a full season at the top level. Um, in the end, I, I, you know, my sponsors agreed to, to fund for me to do a couple of races in World Series at the end of 2004, so I went and did that. Uh, and that went reasonably, reasonably well. I think I finished fourth in my second race uh, at Jerez. Um, and, but then, two, 2000, you know, 2004 and five were probably the two most difficult years for me. Um, you know, we were a bit lost because didn't have a full budget to do Formula 3 or, or World Series or, or anything really. So it was just kind of, uh, I did a bit of A1 GP, did a bit of World Series races here and there, but it was really tough because we didn't have any money to do anything. And at the end of 2005, I just went back to, to India and went back to um, really see what we could do. And then I got in touch with Renault and they said to me that they were starting a new championship in Asia with the Renault V6 series. And um, so they, they, you know, sort of got a deal for me to come there. And so I went back to Asia in 2006 and, um, you know, I really enjoyed it. I think in, in many ways it was, it was nice for me to go back to Asia and have a year of just out of the pressure cooker. You know, I, I started to enjoy my racing again. I think in, by the time I got to 2005, I'd done four years in Europe um, and four tough years, you know, where we were always struggling for money and always in tough situations, for me personally, far away from home and, you know, it was difficult. And I think 2006 for me to go back to Asia was, was quite important to just come out of the pressure cooker. Um, obviously the competition level was lower, but there were still two or three guys at the front where it was good. Um, and I started enjoying my racing and I automatically, you start driving better, you start just, just enjoying life a bit more. Um, but by the end of that year, I won the championship and I knew that if I wanted to go to Formula One, I had to come back to Europe. I think people underestimate what a big mental game this is. Um, you know, you really, the, the focus and the concentration you need is one thing, but a lot of it is motivation. And I think, you know, if you're in a situation where you're, 
you're in a good team and you're in an environment where you get along with the people and, and you're able to work well with people around you, um, you'll automatically drive better. And I think um, a lot of it has to do with each person's individual character. Um, and, you know, some people are just able to get on with it, whatever the situation. Um, other people need, need some of the right circumstances. But, you know, I think for me, really, my, my most difficult days were generally brought about due to worries about money uh, and, and lack of sponsorship. And for me, those were the tough days where, you know, I ended up sometimes doing deals with teams to race just because we didn't have a budget uh, to do it with a, with a better team or with a different team. And you're going there thinking, oh, I, I really don't want to be here, but I have to be here because I have no other choice. And, and automatically you're going into it in a, in a negative sort of mindset, you know. You know, at the end of 2006, I won the championship in Asia, but I had no budget, nothing to carry on. Um, and I was ready to stop. Um, I'd mentally decided that I was going to stop and take a job as a team manager with a Formula 3 team. A friend of mine had offered me a job and I said, okay, keeps me in motorsport, keeps me doing something, um, I'll do it. And uh, we'd started talking about how we do work permits and visas and stuff to live in the UK. And um, I was very fortunate at that time that, um, you, you know, I'd met Bernie Eccleston. My dad and I had already started doing a lot of work with him for TV rights in India and Formula One magazine in India and bits and pieces since 2002. And in 2006, um, I remember I came to see him actually in September, just to backtrack a little bit. And um, he said, oh, so what are you doing? I said, well, I'm still chasing the dream of F1, but I'm racing out in Asia and no real money to come back. And he said, and he said to me, he said, okay, if you win the championship in Asia, give me a call and I'll see what I can do. And um, so I did, won the championship, called him in, I think it must be in October. Didn't hear, and he said, okay, give me a few weeks. Um, oh, he said, give me a few days. And I said, fine. I didn't hear anything for weeks. <laughs> and then he suddenly called and said, right, there's a GP2 test in Herat. Uh, day after tomorrow, um, you need to get there. I've organized a test for you. So I said, okay. And I was in India. So luckily I had the visas in place and everything. So the only seats available were on first class or Lufthansa or something. So I, we got there, my dad and I, and did the test with Campos. And it went okay. And Adrian Campos was quite positive And we were quite happy to work together. And um, so I went back, but I had no budget, no money, and um, called Bernie, and he said, okay, let me see if I can help. Um, I had some sponsors, I had some budget from my existing sponsors, but nowhere close to that. Um, and we went along, and then um, uh, I, what happened was I got it through Red Bull India, and um, you know, we, I'd been speaking, and eventually it, they, we managed to get through with Danny Baha, who was running the Red Bull program at the time, along with Dr. Marco. And Danny, um, in January, called my dad and said, OK, uh, we'll put in some budget. We won't make, you know, we won't be able to give you the full budget like we do with any other drivers, but we'll put forward X amount of money. Uh, and with my other sponsors, I had some budget, went back to Bernie. He helped out a little bit with the team and he, you know, it was great because he got his lawyers to negotiate the contract. I don't even know what the contract was. I never saw it. He negotiated it and sorted it out. Um, and basically, I was the last driver to be signed on the GP2 grid in 2007. And I, it all happened uh, on the 27th of January. And I told this friend of mine I would start working in his F3 team on the 1st of February. So it was four days. And um, that was it. I was off to Paul Ricard and back in Europe. And for me, mentally, I approached GP2 in a totally different way to how I'd come from Asia, um, you know, five, six years before that, because now I'd been given a lifeline. And I think, I think when you're 18, 19, when you come, you're, you're young, you're naive, you know, you, you think you're going to take over the world. Um, you don't appreciate, you know, the opportunity perhaps as much. Um, and I think when I came back in 2007, I came back with the attitude of this every season could be my last season and I've, I've got to make, make it count. Um, GP2 is, is and was a very good championship, uh, I think, for, for drivers to do because you're on, you're on the same weekends as F1, people in F1 are watching you, um, there's a lot of pressure to do well. Um, you know, it was a really tough grid. Um, you know, I can think of the top 
12, 14 drivers who raced that year who have all gone on to do something in F1 or IndyCar or DTM or sports cars or something like that. And, uh, um, yeah, you know, again, I was, a bit, I was a bit unlucky that season because we were... I remember we got to Budapest and basically every race I'd finished, I'd been in the top four, top five. Um, we had a couple of non-finishes, but... And I was fifth in the championship at the time, but within 10 points, there was Grosjean, myself, Senna, um, I think Maldonado, perhaps, you know, we were all within 10 points. Pantano was a little bit ahead. But then from, from Budapest onwards till the end of the season, I scored one point. We had just such bad luck. We had um, engine issues, gearbox issues, tire issues. We had, you know, people just drive into the back of me, um, you know, and it just destroyed my championship. And I just went, you know, down the order. So. Uh, it was very frustrating because, to, you know, 08, I thought I was driving well and I was in, you know, in a good situation, but um, that's life. But at the same time, you know, I had already started speaking to teams in F1 and, um, I, you know, fortunately, Bernie was also helping to speak in open doors and introduce us to people. And um, there, was a, there was a lot of momentum there. Um, and yeah, it, it, you know, I came with a totally different approach, older, wiser, perhaps. Um, and, you know, I really enjoyed my time in GP2. You know, I won races, I had podiums in, uh, in a lot of different, you know, good historic tracks, Monaco, Silverstone, Spa, places like that. And, um, you know, that, for me, it, it was just incredible to go from end of 2006 to have nothing and ready to stop and work a day, you know, desk job to at the end of 2007, in November, I was testing Formula One cars for Red Bull. Um, and it just shows how life, life can change. I, w I remember I was in Italy uh, at a training camp in a, in a place called Pietra Santa in Tuscany and, um, and my dad called and he said, uh, Christian Horner called me this morning. I said, okay. And um, they've, they've decided to put you in the F1 car um, for a few days. I said, I said, you're joking. He said, no. He said, right, you've got to get to Milton Keynes tomorrow for a seat fit. And you're going to start with some straight line testing in Santa Pod, a um, couple of days of that. And then um, we're going to Barcelona and uh, you get your first F1 test. And I just couldn't stop smiling, uh, you know, and, and it was great. I mean, and also it was, it was the early days of, of Red Bull in many ways. And, you know, I remember I went there and they had their first ever simulator. And... Uh, it was like a job interview. So I went to the factory and I met Christian and I mean, I knew him a little bit from before, but I met him again and we had a bit of a chat and they said, okay, we're going to put you in the simulator. And um, it was this really strange looking globe, I remember, and I sat in it and we were, I could not do even a single lap. I couldn't do a single lap. I, I just kept crashing every, every corner. And, and I, the worst was I kept getting ill. I, I wanted to throw up and I couldn't do more than four or five laps without having to get out and need to throw up in the snap. And I thought, oh God, this is a disaster. I've, you know, this is my big chance, big interview, and it's just a disaster. And they're not going to put me in the real car. And you know, you have all these thoughts running through your head. And I went up uh, at lunchtime, I remember, and Christian was there and, um, and I saw him and, I, and he said, oh, how do you get on? I, I said, well, not very well, to be perfectly honest. And I said, you know, I was so ill and, and he's, and he, you know, I was waiting for a, for a big sort of disappointing look and he just smiled and I thought, and he said, yeah, don't worry. He says, this is our first step. You know, he says, Weber threw up in it. Adrian Newey threw up in it. You're not, the, you know, you're not the first one to be ill. Uh, DC can't even drive five laps in it. So yeah, you're not the first one, but we just thought we'd let you see how, the, how you got on. Uh, so it was a massive sigh of relief. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it, it was magic, you know, the first, the first lap that you drive in an F1 car, you, you'll never forget it. You know, it was, it was so special. Um, but my, my first test in, in 07 was actually um, in Barcelona. It was the test where Schumacher made his return. He did a one-off day with Ferrari. Uh, so there was a huge amount of media there that day. Um, and uh, it, it, it was, in one way, you know, you... you you're still a fan of the sport, right? And you're going to, you know, on one hand, your, your head's thinking, wow, I'm here on track with Alonso and Schumacher and all these people. But on the other hand, you're there to do a job. And you can't, you, you know, I, I was never in awe of anybody. 
uh, I was hugely respectful, and I still am. I'm hugely respectful of of these drivers. You know, I think they've there's some fantastic racing drivers on this planet. But I I think I've never been one to be in awe of them. Um, you know, I'm not. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, they're still people. Um, they've got remarkable talent and ability, but they're still people. Um, so yeah, I think I, I I approach it in in a way that. I had my job, my car, my engineers, my people, um, so I just went with that program. Um, you know, Coulthard was in the other car, and I, I, you know, I spoke a little bit with DC. But um, you know, when you're testing, you just you have a you have your own programs and you have your own agendas and your own plans. And the main thing to do is to be professional about it and and do a good job for the team. Um, but then what happened was the testing regulations all changed, and it really clamped down from 2008, 9 onwards, you know, and, and therefore the role of test drivers became much more limited. Um, and in the same way, you know, at the end of 2008, I had a meeting with Dr. Marco and I said, look, what about the future? And at that stage, he already had Vettel was, was uh, you know, was clearly there. Um, they had uh, Bohemi and Algosari. Um, already on the books in DC and Weber were you know still floating around um, I think DC retired soon afterwards but it, it was then a situation of okay there's not really going to be much career progression here for me with Red Bull um, in 2008 because if I wanted to get to F1 they already had a lot of drivers there so um, we, we parted terms um, and, and we did it in a very amicable way you know um, there was no bad blood and in fact you know, 2009, I wasn't a Red Bull driver, but in 2010, when I got to F1, um, Red Bull, you know, they still supported me. We had a bit of a, you know, personal brand endorsement deal with Drinks Portal and things like that. So, um, I think I'm one of the few drivers who left the Red Bull program, still on good terms with Dr. Marco and Thomas Uberall and all the people involved. Um, and then at the end of 2009, obviously, there were three new teams coming into F1 in 2010. Uh, and other, sorry, it was four new teams coming into F1, and um, and really that for me I knew was was an opportunity. You know, I said, look, it's the right timing-wise is right. I've done three years of GP2. I'm experienced now. I feel prepared for F1. I've tested with Red Bull. I've done, you know, I've got some F1 mileage under my belt. Um, and if I'm going to get to F1, this is this is the time. There are eight new seats available. So. We started off speaking with Adrian Campos, who had the, the entry originally as Campos Meta. Um, and we were talking to them about a deal, and there were some possibilities there, but I, it wasn't looking so great. And then at one point, Bernie called and said, look, they're not going to make it, so stop talking to them. Um, I then went and saw um, Lotus in, uh, in Hingham. I, I met with Mike Gascoigne. Um, but they wanted two experienced drivers, uh, so obviously they got Jano and Heike. They, want, they didn't want any rookies, which is fair enough. Uh, I had some meetings with, with Virgin uh, at the time, um, and I didn't have a very good vibe with them, and it looked like they, were, they had signed Glock already, and so it again looked quite difficult. Um, and I met with Peter Windsor and USF1. So I was one of the few drivers who went to Charlotte. I spent three days in Charlotte, in North Carolina, with Peter. Um, and Peter is a great friend. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him, a lot of time for him. But in that situation, I came away from Charlotte thinking, I'm not sure this is going to happen. You know, I came away from Charlotte thinking straight away, I'm not sure these guys are going to make it to the grid. It doesn't, you get a sense of it. You know, I went in November and I got a sense of, yeah, this is looking difficult. So then it was a question of, right, the only real opportunity for me is if this Campos team gets resurrected. And in between, there was, a, there was an opportunity perhaps with Stefan GP. Um, this guy, a person called Zoran Stefanovic had taken over the Toyota cars and he was trying to get an entry. And so then we flew, B Bernie called and said, right, fly to Cologne. He set up a meeting. We went to the Toyota factory, um, had a meeting with him. And actually, that looked like quite a a good option because the Toyota 2009 car was good and I thought that was actually really going to be a good option. Um, but in the end, they, they didn't get the entry, so it didn't go through. Um, so, you know, then Colin Collis took over the, the Hispania thing and 
Um, we knew Colin through Force India, um, obviously through there and, and through Bernie. And, and again, Bernie helped to do the deal with Collis and, uh, and it came through, it, it was coming there, it was, you know, I kept training, I kept, because it, it was getting closer, it was getting closer and we kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And eventually we got the deal signed in, in February. Uh, and I went to Dallara uh, to have the seat fit and I thought, oh my God, this is not good. We're not going to make it, you know, we're just not going to make it. But um, hats off to Colin, you know, um, you know, we had our differences later on, but hats off to him. You know, he did a fantastic job to get the cars to Bahrain and get the team put together on the grid. And the people that Colin had put together on the, or the campus had put together in the team were really good. I mean, the engineering office there um, was fantastic. You know, since, if you look at the people, my race engineers, um, one is now at Mercedes F1, the other one is working with Alonso at McLaren. The chief engineer, Tony Chikorea, is now at Ferrari as chief engineer. Uh, Jeff Willis is heading um, aero stuff at Mercedes. Uh, you know, uh, Chevy's now looking after Toro Rosso and as a chief engineer there. I mean, so the engineering office was fantastic. We had Delara as a partner which was really good. Um, I thought they were, you know, they, I have a lot of respect for Delado. They do a lot of good stuff in the sport. And, you know, so it looked positive. And I thought, okay, we'll have three or four races of pain to start with. But from Barcelona onwards, we should be okay. And what happened was the car that we started the season, um, I met with uh, Walter Biasati and Luca Pignaca from Delara. And they said to me that, look, the car you've got now is the launch car. It's basically, the car that we were going to have just for you to pull the covers off, but it looks like you're going to have to take this to the first three races, um, or first four races, the flyaways basically. And, uh, but when you get to Barcelona, the update, they showed me in the CFD and the CAD drawings, and you know, it was all ready to go. The update was about 60 points of downforce, which was going to be worth, you know, it's going to be worth like two, nearly two seconds, 1.8 seconds of lap time. So it was, it was a huge update that was going to come. And that would have straightway put us into Toro Rosso territory, ahead of all the other new teams. But in the end, for whatever reason, um, the relationship between um, Colin and Delara broke down, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so we never got those updates. And I it was a real shame because I think the car, you know, could have been really competitive. And as I say, we had good engineers and good people to make it a, a competitive team. And unfortunately, because the um, you know, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, but because the updates and the, the, the push forward wasn't coming, therefore my investors and sponsors also lost interest. And they said, well, why are we putting money into a project which is not developing in the way that it should have? So the whole thing kind of broke down in that. But, um, you know, the way that I remember in Barcelona, I got changed in the motorhome for free practice one. And I walked in the garage and... Uh, Christian Klein walked in the garage as well in his race suit with his helmet. And I was like, what are you doing? And he looked at me and said, well, what are you doing? And basically he was driving my car in free practice one, but nobody sort of told me about it. <laughs> it, was, it. It was quite funny in hindsight. You know, it wasn't funny at the time, but in hindsight it was quite funny. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, o overall though, you know, I think, um, you know, I, I fulfilled a dream of being a Formula One driver. You know, I was on the grid there in Bahrain. I had to get in the car straight in qualifying because we couldn't get the car ready for free practice. And that was, you know, a big challenge. And it, for me, we went there with 60 kilos of fuel just to in, do installation laps of the car. But, um, you know, but yeah, there it was. You know, I got the picture on the wall alongside Michael Schumacher and his big return and Alonso and Lewis and Jensen, all these people. Um, you know, and I was there as a Formula One driver. And it was big news in India because we hadn't had a driver for five years, um, you know, and you, you become part of a very exclusive club. And uh, it, it was, you know, it was a roller coaster year, uh, emotionally, mentally, um, because you were always wondering, is someone going to come along with, with budget and, and buy you out? Uh, it was disappointing, obviously, that the updates weren't coming. But on the flip side, it was a question of, okay, um, how do I make the most of what I've got? And um, it was about, you know, competing against other guys in these situations. And, um, you know, on the occasion where I managed to beat a Lotus or a Virgin car or something like that, it was a really satisfying result. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a, 
in hindsight, it was actually quite enjoyable because I got to work with some incredibly intelligent people, um, despite it being difficult circumstances. But for me, as I said, I made use of my time in Formula One uh, on more than one front. One, I, you know, I realized, as I said, from a very young age that media profile and building that relationship is really important. And I worked really hard in F1. You know, I made really good relationships with, with pretty much everyone in the media center, with, with TV channels, with um, not only in Europe, but in Asia and everywhere. So, you know, I'm, it, it became a situation which it started to open up different doors. I started in the second half where I wasn't racing. Um, you know, I started doing commentary work with, with BBC Five Live. And with, I was, I'd already done some work with Star Sports in Asia, of course. But um, I used my time in F1 uh, reasonably wisely to, to open up these other doors in the media world. You know, for me now, you know, I grew up reading about these superstars, Prost and Senna and Mansell and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I've now had the opportunity to sit and have lunch or dinner and, and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with my heroes, you know, Alan Prost or Jackie Stewart or Mansell or Damon Hill. You know, these are all people that I've now been very fortunate to spend time with and, and interact with and, and ask the questions, you know, like, I said to Alan, you know, that 1990 Ferrari, what was that like compared to the 93 Williams? And, you know, all these questions that as a kid, you just dreamt of, of asking your heroes. Um, you know, I've had the opportunity to do it, and that, that's pretty cool. I mean, for, at the end of 2010, um, or towards, towards the end of the season, I spoke with Tony Fernandez, and the Indian Grand Prix was coming up in 2011. And, um, you know, so we talked about it, and he said, look, I've got my two drivers already for the full season, but how about I offer you a deal where you do X number of races, you do a lot of free practice, Friday free practice sessions, so you get some mileage, and you do the Indian Grand Prix and a, and a couple other races. And uh, I said, okay, you know, Hispania, you know, I didn't have the budget to go to them um, for a full season. Um, you know, as I said, my sponsors weren't really keen on it, but this was going to be a good deal for me because I got to be, um, you know, in a slightly better team um, and race at the Indian Grand Prix. But once I got involved with the team, I realized it was a very, very political outfit. And it's a real shame because, again, they had some good people, but they also had some people who were just sort of along for the ride. And T Tony is a very sharp businessman, but unfortunately, he wasn't... I think he underestimated that to be successful in F1, you need to be there full time, you know, and uh, or you need to have people who are strong characters and experienced F1 people leading it full time, and it had neither. Um, and so it just ended up in this political web. It had all the politics of a big team, but in a very small team. And in the end, I didn't, uh, I didn't get the opportunity to race in India. I mean, and um, that week of, of, of not getting the race in India was the hardest week of my life, um, because the whole, I'd gone into that team and I'd done this whole deal. I had other options in F1 to be test driver and reserve driver and other bigger teams. But the only reason I went there was to do this Indian GP. And when that didn't happen, just because of internal politicking and, and you know, people swing Tony's views and mind in different ways. And it, it was very, very difficult. And it was, you know, it's, it, that, that really took a big toll on me. And in many ways, I lost my love of F1 that week. You know, I just thought the politics is just ridiculous, you know, and I, I fell out of love with F1 a little bit that week. Um, and I, I almost fell out of love with motorsport, you know, that in that two, three month period, I was just, I just, I was so angry and so disappointed in the sport that politics was ruining um, what should have been a fantastic time for me. And that was really difficult. But so I went back to India for the winter and then I got a phone call from James Rumsey um, from JRM who's running the Le Mans team. And I was still trying to do things in F1 at the time and just, just because out of anger to prove Tony wrong and to prove the people within Lotus wrong, I wanted to just do something back in F1. And I was, I was negotiating some ridiculously stupid contracts, which in hindsight, I shouldn't have even bothered having conversations. And I'm glad it didn't go through. Um, but yeah, James offered me a chance to go to Le Mans and I thought, okay, this could be interesting. You know, it's a totally 
different type of racing. It's a totally different world. Um, God knows what it's going to be like, but yeah, okay, why not? So I flew to England, met with James, we, and James Ramsey, um, I, I have to say, he's the only person in my life, I've done 15 years of racing, um, he's the one and only contract where when we spoke and had a meeting, we shook hands and he sent me a draft contract five days later, I did not have to negotiate or change even one thing. It, it was just, uh, it was pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, so we went to Le Mans and um, I had two really experienced teammates with Peter Dumbreck and David Brabham who have become really good friends of mine. And they taught me a lot, you know. Uh, it, it's such a different mentality, sports car racing, such a different mentality. You know, the first time I drove the car in Sebring, um, you know, I drove, I did a run, I came back to the pits and I said to the engineer, it was Nigel Stepney who had come from Ferrari, um, real character, Nigel. And people either liked him or loathed him. Uh, and I really got on really well with him. We, we had a lot of mutual respect for each other and I got on really well with Nigel. Uh, he was tough, you know, you, if you did something wrong, if you admitted you were wrong and you put your hands up, he respected you. But if you came up with all these excuses, no, but this is about the tire and the curb and the sand and the drain and this, you came with all these excuses, he had no respect for you. So I, I, you know, if I made a mistake, I put my hands up, said sorry, and we got on and because of that, I think. Um, and I remember the first time I drove the car and it was completely different to a single seater, big, heavy, uh, but a lot of downforce, it was really quite enjoyable to drive. I came in the pits and I said to, you know, got on the radio and I'm like, right, I think we need to do this and do this and do this and change this and change that. And nobody did anything, like nobody moved. They all just stood there and I was like, oh, what's going on? And it's only then I realized that sports car racing is different. It's, you know, you have to do everything by committee because whatever you change for yourself has to work for the other two drivers. So you have to really, it took me, took me six months. It took me till Le Mans, I think, to change my mentality and say, okay, I just need to slow down here and, and just think, okay, we need to talk all three of us and agree and, and there's a lot I need to learn from these guys as well. And so it, it was, yeah, it, it was a lot, there's a lot of uh, changing of the mindset, I think, um, going to sports cars. But in the end, I absolutely loved it. You know, Le Mans was you know, you hear about how oh, such a great race, best race in the world, blah, blah, blah. And honestly, when I was there, I, I thought I didn't really enjoy it in the week building up to the race. Um, you know, you're there a long time. You're in the middle of nowhere in France. You're there from the previous Sunday. You know, there for six, seven days doing, you know, just hanging around. There's, you obviously got practice and qualifying and all that, but there's a lot of hanging around. And I didn't really enjoy all of that. But the actual, by the time we got to the, the Saturday, Sunday of the race, it was magic. I, I just absolutely loved it. Um, and it's, it is so addictive, you know, it really is the best race in the world. It is such a good race to do and it's hard. It's such a hard race to do. Towards the end of uh, 2012, um, I spoke to Alejandro Agag um, when I heard about Formula E, even before it became a big public thing. And I knew Alejandro from GP2 times. And I was really interested in it, you know, it's, it's new, it's different and I like the idea of him doing street races because you're taking the sport to the people, you're not forcing them to come out to the middle of nowhere to a racetrack, uh, they can take the tube or the bus to it, you know, and I thought that's, that's pretty cool and I like driving street races, I think it's, it's different. So um, I started speaking to him about it and he said to me, he said, um, do you think we can get an Indian team on board? I said, well I can try. So I started speaking to Mahindra and um, in fact, you know, I'd spoken to Mr. Mahindra about doing something in F1 back in 2011. Uh, then I spoke to him about doing something in Le Mans and IndyCar, uh, it didn't quite work out. Uh, they weren't really interested in it. Um, but Formula E seemed to sort of be something that they were keen on. So I, I started in, you know, I introduced them to Alejandro's people and I took them to India. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Formula E offices on conference calls, negotiating the contracts for them. And it, it was interesting for me because as a driver, it was a chance to put a team together as well and, and see a different side of the sport and learn about how other, other aspects of the sport work. So it was, it was quite fascinating. Um, and um, 
you know, and then we we uh, we did the deal to to drive for the team, uh, and for me, it's very exciting uh, to be the, again an Indian driver in an Indian team for the first time in a full FIA championship. Um, you know, is is very exciting, and it, it's been it, it's it's been an interesting first few months, I'd say, in Formula E because it is so different. It is so different from any other type of car in some ways. But in other ways, when you drive it, it's still got four wheels and a steering wheel, you know. So um, I think, is it the future? Time will tell. Um, you know, I think we, there's a lot of things which we have to do. We have to make the cars faster. We have to do, you know, do various bits and pieces to make the championship better. But what's nice about Formula E is that people are open. You know, I, you know, any of us are able to pick up the phone, talk to Alejandro and say, look, I think you should do this, this and this. Change the rules, do this a bit. And he listens, you know, and we can do things like that. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of limitations because battery technology is still, you know, evolving and, and the technology, the motor and the drivetrain is still evolving. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see where it's at in two or three years time. Driving the Formula E cars, actually, the biggest thing is the sound. You know, you, when you're driving it, you have no sound. So you don't realize, I think, when you drive normal race cars, what a big part of your driving experience the sound is. For example, when the car starts to slide, you don't actually know how much to lift because you can't hear it. So all of that takes some getting used to. I mean, now it's fine, but it took the first two or three days of testing to really get your head around it. Also, we're not on slick tires. You know, we're on groove tires, so the car's moving around a lot. Um, there's a lot of things which are quite different, quite strange. There's a lot of weight on the back axle of the car. So the way you drive it is a bit weird. Um, and the, the technology, how you use the recharge and the regeneration of the power and stuff is, is really key to being successful. So there's a lot of stuff which is very different uh, and that you have to learn about it. And um, that's been really interesting. As an engineering exercise, it is really interesting. Um, as a driving exercise, you know, we needed to be a bit faster, I think, um, to be a real challenge. But it's a massive mental challenge right now because you're constantly having to calculate the energy numbers and to make sure you've got the right amount of energy to get you to the end of the race. So I think if you look at the grid in Formula E, I mean, it's a seriously strong field. I think 14 drivers out of the 20 have got Formula One test or race experience. Um, a lot of guys from IndyCar or sports cars, you know. If you look at World Motorsport today and you look at the just the pure list of drivers, forget what cars we're driving, it's probably one of the most competitive lists of drivers on, on the planet, um, which makes it a great challenge because in qualifying, for example, you know, if you're two or three tenths off, you'll be six places further back. Um, and it is, you know, it is, it is tough. We're all pushing really hard because um, we all want to get, we're all competitive. Um, but it's a slightly different feel, I think, to when we were in GP2 or F1 because we've all known each other for a long time. We're all a bit more mature now. But also, we're all trying to learn together. You know, we're all trying to work together to make the show better, to make the championship better. We're all trying to, um, in some ways, of course, on race day, we all want to beat each other. But on other ways, when, when the race is over, we all take a step back and say, right, you know, it was a good race, but if we do this, this and this, we can make it better. And then we put our views as drivers together to the organizers and things like that. So um, it is a slightly different attitude in that, yes, we're all trying to beat each other as racing drivers do, but we're also trying to collectively work to make the series better.